Hello, how's it going? Thank you for the intro. Thank you, Christine. So Honeycomb is a tool for helping you understand your complex software systems. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, right now, if you're a software engineer in the industry, maybe some of you have experienced this at internships, when you're trying to figure out what's happening in production, you typically have two types of tools. You have monitoring tools, which give you graphs, which give you dashboards, where you, you scroll through lots of things until you find maybe a graph that spikes in an interesting way, and then you can kind of look for other graphs that, let you, that spike in an interesting way. Or you have logging tools, which deal with kind of all the uh, text output from your, normal, uh, from your normal applications, and you go hunting for that needle in the haystack that will tell you what went wrong. Honeycomb's thesis is that these are two things that have sort of evolved in uh, a direction that made sense from the constraints that we had in the 90s. We had, when you had grip, when you had counters, when we were like, all right, well, you know, CPU and memory are very, very uh, expensive, so we're gonna do everything very cheaply. It is now 2019. It is terrible to be constrained by the things that people decided 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. So with Honeycomb, we're saying, you can have both. You can have not only uh, these graphs that we're used to, but also all the fidelity, all the extra metadata, all of that useful information in your logs that told you what happened. You can have them together. Uh, we use the word events, just to describe things that are happening in our system. And we talk about Honeycomb as letting you finally see your production system in high res, meaning you can, you can see the big picture and then zoom in and get really close and understand why and what and how to fix what's going on with your software. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of why Honeycomb, why now, uh, we're really seeing a few uh, kind of overwhelming trends in the software industry right now. One, technology, uh, you know, the only, the only constant is change, so on and so forth. Um, there's a bunch of technology choices that, have, that are, are becoming popular that are changing how people are deploying software and maintaining software. Containers, microservices, Kubernetes, all of these pieces of technology mean that uh, the average software system these days has more moving parts. It's harder to keep track of uh, which pieces are interacting with which other pieces and wh where, where the problem is coming from. Along with that, uh, while technology is often the catalyst, we're also seeing changes in the process of engineering teams. Agile has been going on for a while, but things like CI, CD are changing how people think about how they commit to master, how they push changes to production, and finally, uh, the people, where we're literally seeing, you know, people are now defining themselves as a DevOps team because they're recognizing that the boundary between developer of I'm going to write some code and push it to master when I'm done, and operator, the people who have to maintain that software once it's in production, they're seeing that line blur and they're, they're looking for ways to uh, bridge those two disciplines that were previously thought to be completely different disciplines. And with these changes, we're finding, people are finding that their tools are currently outdated. So to give you an idea of what people are using Honeycomb for, uh, our company's been around for three years. We have a number of customers that have used us uh, to change how they're shipping software. Often people come in first for an instant response use case. They're finding out that when they're experiencing downtime, their current tools aren't giving them answers as to why. They can tell them, they can tell the engineering team that something is wrong, but they can't figure out you know, the, the combination of, of factors that are actually causing an incident, allow them to resolve the incident. That's often what brings folks to us. That, that's often what gets us in the door. But more and more, we're seeing people use Honeycomb not just to figure out why their code in production is not behaving as expected in an incident context, but more like, why isn't it as fast as I expect? Why isn't my code as efficient as I expect? Okay, well, let's go look at what's, what it's doing. Let's go look at uh, you know, outliers and, and why my software might be behaving in a certain way. And then we're seeing this cool use case, this cool flywheel of engineering teams folding Honeycomb into their development processes, using it to drive decisions about what could write in the first place, what normal is, what use cases uh, or, or customer use cases to build for, and really, seeing this really cool virtual cycle, virtuous cycle build in 
in their development processes in order to ship better code, not just faster, like CI CD promises, but also being able to ship with more confidence that your code will do what you expect it to do once it hits production. Uh, to give you a very high level overview of where Honeycomb sits and what it actually does, we ingest a bunch of data. This is logs, agents in your code, whatever. We ingest a bunch of data. We have uh, a custom column store built on SSDs. Uh, that column store lets us slice, dice, analyze, visualize. It gives you insight into your data so that you can start to ask questions about, okay, well, why did latency spike? Oh, well, which endpoint did it spike for? Which customer did it spike for? Is there some strange, uh, you know, is, is it being impacted by one of my Mongo instances rather than the entire cluster? Uh, and this, I have included a video which may or may not work of just what Honeycomb looks like. Do, 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 do. And it seems like it is. Um, but what this is showing is it's showing us a graph, being able to slice and dice by customer ID in this case. It's a platform we may have for genius workloads and not just uh, We believe in tools that not just tell you the answer, but help point you in the right direction. And what we've done here is the user has said, ah, oh, this artifact is weird. Tell me what's special about it. And we've gone through and we've done some statistical analysis to say, hey, that user ID, there's one user that pops out in that highlighted section. And again, as your understanding of what's happening in production and why evolves, you go in, click through, find a trace of a single execution, get down to this level of detail that really helps me understand what my code is doing, and then I can continue that, I can continue that cycle. I can take what I've learned here, feed it back into this higher level question of why is my code not behaving the way I expect. Uh, this is a recycled deck. Our customers love us. Um, and to give you an idea of uh, where, how far, how far we are, what we've been working on, uh, Honeycomb has been in existence since the very beginning of 2016. First year, we really spent building out our prototype and establishing the market. And this is something that lots of entrepreneurship classes will, not, will tell you not to do. Um, but what we really saw is when we looked at the market, people wanted log tools or they wanted monitoring tools, because that's what they were used to looking for. So we started talking about, hey, observability is this thing that isn't really captured by what your tools currently allow. Observability is about asking new questions of your systems, as well as the processes and, and uh, culture that supports it. 2017 and 2018 has been taking that prototype, these ideas, this excitement, uh, really starting to land, uh, turn our kind of early adopters into customers, seeing traction, learning lots of lessons about uh, GTM, especially as a developer tool in a B2B market. And uh, right now we're, we're in the stage where we're really trying to, uh, feels like we've really grown up kind of out of our awkward teenage phase into our young adult phase of, we know what, we've, we know what we're doing, we know what our value prop is, we know who we're talking to, and now we just, gotta, now we just have to show that it's repeatable and um, go out there and kill it. So that's where we are. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to the context, and now we can. Yeah, thank you so much, Christine. Great. Thanks for agreeing to do a little bit of interview session with the group. Uh, we're going to leave this. Fantastic up. intro. Right. Um, before I kind of get into some of the formal questions, you and I were having a little bit of a chat before you were talking today, and I was sharing with you um, about where I started off on a technical track and. Uh, ended up moving into a product management check. But you and I actually talked a little bit about that. You were heavy on the technical side. Lots of students that I interact with, uh, one of the top questions that they ask is, do I stay on a technical track? Hmm. Do I go on a product track? Should I do both? When would I do both? But you've had a really interesting perspective on that. I thought that'd be a great way to open up. Awesome. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, I had a CS degree. I have been a software engineer. I identify as a software engineer. I've been working for about 10 years. Um, for the last... I would say for the last two years, what I've primarily been doing is not software engineering. But all of that software engineering experience has really helped me understand the problem domain uh, in the, the folks that we're working with, right? It lets me go to customers and really understand their problems, understand uh, what their 
software development practices might be like because I've seen, I've been a professional software engineer in enough different environments that I can start to, uh, you know, understand what is normal and what is not. And it really helps, it has really helped me build up um, when working with customers an understanding of the right phrases to pull on. Mm. Right? If you're doing customer development, you're talking to a customer, you're, they're telling you about their problems. Um, there are certain phrases that I'm much better at, at being like, oh, tell me more about that that a salesperson or someone who's less familiar with software might not be able to. Got it, very cool. Um, so one of the main, the top reason why startups fail is because of lack of product market fit. And uh, that's the most difficult thing to figure out. You think you've identified an unmet need in the marketplace and it turns out it wasn't really a problem in the marketplace or there was other competitors in the space or you saw the need differently. So. Um, last time I checked, I think you guys raised over $15 million. You're generating revenue. But tell me a little bit about where this idea came from and how you sort of took it from this initial seed of an idea and got it to a company that's now generating revenue and has done really well in raising some, some capital. Awesome. Uh, Honeycomb started because I was, uh, started from myself and my co-founder Charity working together at a company called Parse, which was got bought by Facebook. And um, at Parse, we were dealing with tons of unmitigated chaos. It was just, we were a platform uh, that allowed mobile developers to basically include a black box and suddenly get all the benefits of having servers and databases and everything. Um, and it meant that it was great for our users, they loved us. We had to deal with their chaos. And we had to deal with, oh gosh, the shared resource is being slammed. Who is it being slammed by? Why? Who else is it impacting? And how can we put a band-aid on it so everyone else's service is un undamaged? Um, and this, this, this question of what's happening, why, uh, let's tease it apart and isolate, isolate the, the, the problems that I talked about in that demo, that's exactly what Charity and I and the other folks on the Parse team were doing day to day. When we got by, bought by Facebook, um, one of the things that happens when big companies buy little companies is they kind of pat you on the head and they're like, oh, you're so cute, here are the big kid toys. Um, and with Facebook, most of them were garbage for our use case. Great for Facebook's use cases, not for ours. But one of them stood out. It was called Scuba. And it let us really quickly slice, dice, understand our system in a way that changed how we built, how we, how we uh, maintained our software, how we built our software moving forward. Um, and I think for us, really the impetus behind this was thinking about going back out there, away from Facebook, the largest software industry, and not having this tool at our fingertips. Because mm -hmm. we'd spent we, you know, we, we had our battle scars from trying to solve these sorts of problems with traditional monitoring tools, traditional logging tools, um, and it was just so painful that we were like, this, this must exist. Yeah. I think the thing that we, uh, the thing that becomes easy to discount when um, a startup idea comes out of that environment is how, uh, how much easier it is to push adoption inside an organization versus outside. Right. Facebook has the luxury of saying, ah, well, new engineer, here are the tools you're going to use. This is why th these are the trade-offs, and these are the only tools you get to choose from. Uh, a little different out here in the real world, um, but it's been a lot of fun kind of being, it's been a lot of fun being able to start off with that conviction of, we know that this is the right problem to solve, that this is the right approach, because we've lived it, and we, we ourselves are true believers. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how the founders came together, how you started thinking about um, roles and responsibility mm -hmm. and, and that dynamic, because that's the second reason why startups fail. Wrong people are involved or they're in the wrong position, and that's another really hard part to get right. Yeah. Um, so Charity and I had worked together for a few years at Parse before jumping into this together, and um, we actually didn't spend a ton of time working directly. Uh, she was the first infra hire, eventually ran the back end software engineering team. Um, I was a product engineer who built our analytics product. And most of our interactions early on were like me shipping something and then her being ops coming over and knocking on my door and being like, Christine, this thing broke. Help me fix it. Um, and so it's, it's funny because that, that relationship that we had was almost, is almost the sort of exact sort of relationship we're trying to break down now with something like Honeycomb. Um, but I think that we had a lot of mutual respect for each other, um, both working on this product that we love, that we cared a lot about, and um, we're especially excited to work with each other on a tool like Honeycomb 
because we both felt like we brought dramatically different perspectives in an important way that would help us make sure that we shipped the right, the right product in the end. Right? Ultimately, Honeycomb is a tool for software engineers with operational responsibilities or operational sensibilities. Um, we call them software owners, people who are comfortable in code, comfortable shipping code, uh, but ultimately want to be responsible for how that code continues to behave in production. Um, so we're excited to work with each other for those reasons. We're bringing that, those kind of different skill sets to the table. Um, we, I think when we started out, um, we were not, we were not the sort of people to be like, oh, well, five years down the road, we're going to be a 200 person company and you should be CEO and I'll be CTO and then we'll have these like giant organizations underneath us. Uh, we were very pragmatic. We were yeah. very just like, okay, these are these roles that need, need filling right now. Um, one of us has to be CEO uh, and none of it will really matter because for this first year, we just need to build, build stuff. Um, and so Charity kind of reluctantly took on this burden of being CEO. Um, and I say burden because that's how she felt. Uh, you know, we were engineers going and, and developing relationships with CEOs and, uh, sorry, uh, developing relationships with investors and uh, figuring out how to sell are not, are not things that really were exciting to us at the time. We wanted to build a product that would change how, how people like us would, would do their jobs. Um, and I think it was actually perfect in the beginning because Charity had spent so much time uh, as an operator kind of developing this public voice she did a lot of speaking before with her work through Mongo um, and was very well practiced at going out there into the industry and saying, hey, guys, there's gender neutral, guys. Uh, there's something like different. There can be, there's, there's something, uh, you can be doing your jobs differently. There is this new future. I've seen it. Guys, it's so great over here. Sorry, guys, gender neutral. Um, and especially when that first year was spent building up the market, building up the understanding of why observability mattered and why Honeycomb's approach was important. I think it was great to have her kind of more publicly out there, uh, myself more focused on the product. Um, in the last, uh, this spring, we actually sort of changed roles. Mm. So I'm now CEO, she is CTO. Oh, wow. Um, and I think that it, you know, feels on one hand, it feels like a big change, right? Oh, changing roles, like what does that, what does that mean? What does it mean for our focus as a change? On the other hand, uh, as a startup goes from baby startup to three-year-old startup, the needs of each role also changes, right? Uh, the, the type of person that you need to be to get something off the ground, that sort of CEO that you need to be to get the industry and, and get folks excited about this new vision um, can be a very different person than that CEO who needs to get to that repeatable sales model. And so I think uh, because we started off with this very strong um, base of trust between the two of us and understanding of each other's strengths and skills, we have been able to both do what is best for the company. Yeah, yeah. So just follow on to that because I'm really fascinated with that dynamic and how uh, did conflict resolution and, and disagreements, did that just sort of happen naturally? Did that take some work? And the other the part two of that question is, and I've talked a lot about Generation Z and millennials, how incredibly self-aware they are, but that's, that, that's an incredibly rare insight to have the kind of self-awareness to focus on what the needs of the company are and be able to literally adapt and take on a different role. So did, Where'd that level of self-awareness come from? And just the dynamic of how this, you know, how the magic of getting this chemistry, right? Charity's pretty exceptional. Yeah. Um, and she had been a manager for many years um, at Parson before. Uh, and so I, all credit for that self-awareness, I think really goes to her. Yeah, very cool. That's awesome. Okay. Third reason why startups fail, they uh, run out of money and can't raise money. So of the universe of early stage companies in the world, um, the last stat that I looked at, maybe 10%, if they're lucky, get a meeting with an institutional investor. And then of that, maybe 10% of that actually gets a term sheet and gets funded. So you know, raising money at, at the level that you guys have done, so walk me through a little bit how you were able to overcome that challenge. So my guess was people weren't lining up trying to throw money at you guys and how you were able to get the company capitalized to um, Funny you should describe it like that. Doing. Yeah. Uh, this is another point in favor of working at an existing company for a while 
uh, before jumping into a startup. Um, because Charity and I had done our time, worked at a number of different companies, because Charity had for the last, I think, two years that she'd spent at Parse, really invested in going, doing the conference circuit and talking about Mongo and becoming sort of a, a domain expert in uh, Mongo reliability engineering, uh, she, she was sort of more of a known quantity. Mm. And especially when early stage startups also involve bringing in customers and, and getting folks to pay attention to you, um, that was very much a point in our favor when we were raising our first seed round. Um, and I actually remember one of our one of my one of my first conversations with one of our early investors. Um, he was sort of a casual acquaintance, and I was like, "Hey, wanted to catch up. Uh, how's it going?" He's like, "Oh, I'm so glad you reached out. I heard Charity Majors left Facebook. Do you know what she's doing next?" Uh, and I was able to just sit back and kind of crack up because I was like, oh, well, I'm glad you asked. We're working together on a startup. I hear you have money. Um, I think since then it has, uh, you know, it only, it only gets harder once they uh, expect you to have more results to show at each step of the way. You know, seed yeah. funding I think is a really important institution, uh, but uh, they're at that point, they're betting on you, they're betting on your potential, they're betting on your idea and how excited they are about the market. And a lot of these uh, difficult to quantify things. Um, and one thing that uh, is certainly true and that we have been able to experience ourselves is, okay, well, two rounds down the road, what do you have to show for it? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a very different conversation. Yeah, awesome, cool. Um, one of the more challenging, so getting the product right Figuring out product market fit super challenging. Getting the right people on board and in the right position is really hard. And getting the company uh, capitalized. The other part that also is, is incredibly difficult to figure out is your go-to-market strategy. So I'm wondering um, who your customers are, how the market segments, and how you've been able to um, uh, reach your market, how you figured all of that out, and were able to start establishing value and generating revenue. This has been... Um an incredible learning experience for us. <laughs> so again, a couple engineers who knew that it's not as simple as you know if you build it, they will come. Um, and certainly at Parse, we're coming out of this being like, okay, well, we need to charge money first, or else we will have to sell to Facebook because we have no, we don't have enough revenue coming in. Um, not a bad, not a bad way to go. Uh, I think it has been fascinating. So we started off thinking. Well, of course, we're going to. We've always priced per based on storage. Um, a lot of uh, other customers in the space will do things like price based on seat, price based on um, host, um, how many hosts you're currently monitoring, um, and for various reasons, we felt like those were how those were a pricing models put in place by business people, and not by engineers, um, and b sort of a relic of how again systems worked in the past and how a reflection of how um, infrastructure looked in the past. So we've always priced based on storage. And we sort of started out with this thesis that people who have sufficiently complex infrastructures will need, have the budget and will have the need to pay for something, a tool that really helps them understand it. Um, and I think there has been a little bit of, uh, because of the lack of a really strong business voice early on, um, we did a lot of exploration, and we had a lot of early success with folks who had been around the block, tried a bunch of tools, and got it, who were like, hey, I hear you, you're saying, like, Honeycomb is taking the right approach, I believe in this, I'm going to place a bet on you, almost, almost like investors do with seed stage companies. Um, and I think the thing that we discounted in trying to repeat that is the role of navigating an organizational structure finding your way to that buyer from a practitioner who might absolutely get it, but has no pull in their organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that in 2018, especially the end of 2018, we've gotten a lot better at first uh, finding kind of a pressure release valve for those practitioners who are very excited, but are never gonna be able to justify a large deal. So, okay, we've released a self-serve tier. Uh, you can self-select into this. You don't have to talk to a salesperson and you can just get up and going and on your way. At the same time, we've gotten a lot better at uh, understanding, first, identifying who our buyer is, what our entry point is, who to talk to, um, and second, not 
framing the value of Honeycomb in terms of our technical capabilities, but what it will enable their engineering team to do, right? Mm. Very natural, we're engineers. Hey, remember, remember how you want to try to do this thing and you couldn't um, and you were on call and, and, and your life sucked? We have the solution. That works really well for the person who's actually being woken up, not so much for the CTO or VP of engineering who's like, ah, oh, on call. I remember when I was on call X years ago. Um, and so it, it has been uh, an education and a, re a revelation in figuring out how to speak to that person uh, as well as how to assemble the right team of folks to help us speak to that person. Because charity and my brains are, are wired precisely the wrong way constantly. And so it's, it's this. Right unwiring, uh, constant unwiring that we have to do yeah. when speaking to buyers. That takes a lot of discipline. Yeah. That's fantastic. So as I look out into the audience, I see future entrepreneurs like yourself. What lessons um, would you share with them about your journey? Um, what have you really learned that taught, you know, three things that you think would be important for a future entrepreneur? Uh, I'm going to give lessons to my, my past self who probably would not have characterized herself as a future entrepreneur. So I'm assuming all of you, the fact that you're here, you are all already past this point. I'm going to save these lessons anyway, because I can. Um, as a technical person, it was very easy for me to be like, oh, well, marketing, soft skills. Sales, soft skills. I can figure those out. Um, and man, I wish I could go find my 18-year-old self and like smack myself upside the head and then make myself go sit in a marketing class just to understand uh, how what, what playing pieces you have there, what levers you have, what, um, what, what people in a different role care about and how that boundary should work, right? Because yes, I'm technical, that's, that's a great advantage to have, but if you, don't know, if you don't know what you are missing in these other roles, not only can you probably not do it yourself well right away, it also becomes much harder to find someone who can. Um, and building the right team, hiring. We've had a couple kind of hiring missteps along the way because we didn't know what, what good looked like and what we were missing. Um, another lesson, I think uh, I am, so you mentioned the, the company I started when I was uh, 23 in 2011. Um, when I was 23, that startup was only ever myself and my co-founder. Uh, my daily, I worked six days a week from around 11 a.m. until 4 a.m. every night. And I know it was 4 a.m. because that's when the last bus left from market back down to Lower Haight, wow. where I lived, um, consistently. Uh, Saturday nights, I would end like around like 1 or 2, and I'd like to do a shot and then go meet up with my friends at a bar. Um, there is a level of sustainability. Again, I'm hoping this is not news to any of you. Um, but there, there are things that you can, you can do. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should. And probably means that you're not going to be your best self when you when you when you when you do them. Um, two of our first employees um, at Honeycomb were dads of toddlers, so they had to go home at five to put their kids to bed. Did I work at four in the morning? <laughs> you know, sometimes they would come back online yeah. um, and work on their own schedule. But it, it, I think f with Honeycomb, we were able to uh, set the expectation from the beginning, like. <coughs> We are hiring you, and in hiring you, we tr we are extending the trust that you are going to uh, do your work sustainably and kind of police yourself. Right? You are going to um, not burn yourself out. You're going to uh, be responsible and do all the things that like you should be doing. But well, I don't, I don't want to be having to tell you to go home at, at 2 a.m. because it's been the fourth night in a row that you've been at work. Uh, and I think charity, honestly, this is easy for us to say, and Charity and myself, again, probably have the most irregular, terrible schedules of everyone in the company, but being able to set that expectation up front that we do not expect it of the company, I think has allowed us to hire uh, a type of person that um, lots of companies looking for ninjas and rock stars would love to hire, but can't. Um, and I think the third thing, actually, then, for, for future entrepreneurs is don't... Uh, don't undervalue the uh, culture of a company when, when starting, right? Um, lots, of lots of other startup founders will say that their biggest problem is hiring. Um, with Honeycomb, granted, we're pretty lean right now, but we, uh, I'm lucky, we're lucky enough to say that uh, with the exception of 
good marketing people who can, set, who can market technical products. I, I believe the hardest role to hire for um, in the industry. We have been lucky enough to not really have had a problem with hiring because people come to us because they know that we respect our engineers, we respect our employees. There is um, a, 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 an attitude of humility towards these other disciplines. You're not going to, you know, a salesperson isn't going to join Honeycomb and be, be like, looked down on um, because we've gone through and learned all these lessons and, and been made humble by the rest of the industry. Um, and that they're, you know, frankly, I think our engineering team, uh, I think our entire company is um, like half women. And that the, the, the sorts of things that you establish very early on um, when it's two founders or two founders and two employees and, and that N plus one problem, it, establishing the right culture early and, and saying that you care about the things that you care about early really sets a tone for hiring far, far down the road, farther than you can see. That's awesome, fantastic. Um, so one of the, um, in doing some research and looking into your background, talking a little bit last night, and just in this conversation here today, you strike me as, as a polymath person, someone who um, is incredibly gifted, obviously incredibly bright, but can grasp and gain a lot of knowledge in a lot of different disciplines. And that's, that's pretty rare. I worked with Elon Musk, he was able to do that. But one of the things that I think uh, is a testament to this ability, and I wonder if you could tell the audience a little bit about, you know, most folks can either be fantastic at B2B or mm -hmm. super fantastic at B2C. Like these are entirely different markets, entirely different needs. Um, the fact that you've been successful in both of those areas, I would can say tell both. me a little bit about what you learned through that and how that skill came about and, and how you were, you know, have this ability to be so successful in B two B and then also so successful in B two C. I'm gonna. I, I would not say that. I would not characterize myself yeah. as successful in B two C. Frankly, I think B two C is sort of a, a consumers. Just consumers are fickle and, and magical, and anyone who gets B two C is they see the future in a way that I don't. Um, I think what is, what draws me to B two B, frankly, is the conviction that I understand the problem, uh, and that's that's the the power in being a developer, building developer tools. Um, I can immediately empathize. I can I, I can smell the, the the I don't know if I can swear. Uh, I can smell the the, the 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 pitfalls that I might that we might fall into um, a little bit better. And um, I think what I enjoy, and and certainly again my personality rather than anything is uh, with B two B we have the, a little bit more of the time and luxury to really understand our customers, to really understand an account understand what's special about their engineering team, about their practices, about the problems that face them, the problems that are unique to their business. Um, that's a lot of fun for me and really informs our product, uh, informs how we think about you know, reaching the next, few, the next end customers like them. And uh, I, think, I, I think helps them feel like Honeycomb is really one of their partners rather than just a vendor or a, uh, you know, some tool that they use. Okay, cool. What's critical, obviously, is recruiting and hiring really great talent. You're only as good as your talent. And tell me a little bit about what do you value more, pure raw engineering talent or domain expertise? And uh, how, does, you know, how does your sort of recruiting process work and um, how you reconcile those two, to, to those two items? This is a great question. Uh, I honestly would probably say uh, neither one is the most important for us when hiring. Raw engineering talent is important, um, but not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I think we, and we actually have some posts on our, our blog about our hiring process. Uh, we would much rather see, understand how someone thinks. And constructing technical interviews is a topic that I'm sure, if you wanted to, you'd get a panel up here and take like three hours discussing the merits of. Um, but there, there, there are so many dimensions of building software, shipping software as part of a team that whiteboard interviews simply don't capture. Uh, I will call out Stripe as another example of a really great company that does their engineering interviews in a slightly different way, where they accept that, uh, and we accept that software engineering is about, it's about reading code, probably more than about writing code. It's about pairing with someone to talk through a problem. It's about understanding the architecture of the problem, and especially for us, for a product engineer, we want them to be thinking about what the experience is for the user. 
we're a small startup. We're allowed. We're right now. We're still at a stage where we uh, are able to embrace people who aren't just you know give me a, give me a spec and I'll, I'll execute on it. We love people who can be given a technical problem, but make those trade-offs and make those decisions based on what they think the, the best user experience is. And um, so it's, you know, domain expertise is something that can be learned. Um, again, as a developer tool, you, we have the additional leg up of lots of people come in naturally with domain expertise because they've had to deal with production incidents on the job. Um, and raw engineering talent is something that engineering ladders can address and, and ideally is already happening on the job. But it's the, there's, there's an element of curiosity and openness and uh, kind of acceptance that you have different skill set than I do, but we can work together and pair and, and build something awesome. Mm -hmm. that, that is, I think, what gets us much more excited about an engineering candidate. Very cool. Um, tell me a little bit about your culture how you guys built it? Did it happen organically? Was it purposeful? What shaped it? Uh, how would you describe it? Uh, I would say it is fairly purposeful. So um, again, Charity and myself worked at Parse. Um, one of the things I think uh, became very clear to us was how, that Parse was very special to us because everyone who joined um, cared deeply about the problem domain and the way that we were addressing it. Uh, and there was a parse when parse, there was a point when parse was like 20 people and everyone had built an app on parse, uh, even the even the office manager. Like it, it was just cool, um, and that was something that was really special and was something that kind of had effortlessly come out of those founders. So when Charity and I started Honeycomb, we were very aware of how the things that we did, things that we signaled were important to us, would shape the culture moving forward. Um, and how uh, how easy it is to let something spin away with if you're not paying attention to it. So uh, again, model you know we started off being very conscious of visibly visibly and vocally rewarding the uh, behaviors that we wanted to support, while you know very if we for example um, working late right Charity and I worked late all the time. But if, if one of our engineers who we knew had a kid was working late, we'd be like, hey, you need to get home? Like, you know, there's no, thanks for working late. I, I saw you, you know, tried really hard. There's no, you know, thanks for working at 11 p.m. on, on things, the day before Thanksgiving. Yeah. None of that. Uh, it was very, we were very conscious of those signals that we would send because even though we knew those first two hires really well, well, that next hire might, might pick up those cues and, and learn that, Oh, well, I'm expected to be here at 11 p.m. the day before Thanksgiving, too. We think that's terrible. Um, and I think that that extended to, again, uh, work-life balance. That extended that extends to how we want engineers to work with each other um, in a very collaborative style rather than a, like, leave me alone style. Um, and I think that it's a, we are constantly looking and, and, and seeing and course correcting. And we've been very lucky to hire um, to have hired some, some managers who are similarly very conscious and invested in uh, facilitating a culture of learning and curiosity yeah. to support the raw engineering talent that all of our engineers have. That's awesome. All right, we got one final question, then we'll open up for some Q&A. And I'm gonna steal Tina Seelig's, uh, my favorite question. Go back in time, you're having a conversation with your 20-year-old self. What advice would you give that person? Sleep more and have more fun. <laughs> uh, I, you know. Uh, Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, worked really hard in college. I don't regret it. Um, I'm sure I learned a lot. But like, you know, if, I, if my GPA was like a couple point, you know, tenths lower, um, would I have had some more fun? Probably. Would it have made a difference to where I am today? Probably not. Um, I think that in, in life, in work, uh, it's constantly a game of prioritization, right? Uh, if I, if I, I have these 10 to-do items, which one is the one that I can do that'll have the most impact so that I can go to sleep and not feel bad about the other nine? That's something that I wish I'd perfected when I was in school to, so that I could maximize for learning I could maximize for, um, I mean, the, the biggest bang for my buck for things that would make my grades still be good. But uh, I look back and I'm like, you know what? 
people talk about things like Thirsty Thursday, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I always had a lab or a giant pee set or something due Friday mornings, and I had a very boring Thursday night, always. Yeah. Man. That's awesome. Fantastic. So. Well, look, I can tell you just from the short time that we spent together, unless you've been snoozing through this thing, your energy, your positive attitude, it's so infectious. I literally, to have such a technical product, like I go work for you. You made it so interesting and so cool. Um, and I hope all of you felt that way as well. I want to thank Christine for an amazing talk. I will tell you, I'm just so impressed with the ability for you to create your own path. It seems like you've done that your entire life. Uh, you create your own opportunities and just your energy is just exploding here in this room. So let's give Christine a massive round of applause for an amazing Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. If you have any questions, come on up.